Dear friends in Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A word again from our gospel this evening. When the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table with the twelve apostles. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. The word of the Lord. Dear friends, do very many people here watch chef shows where they have a competition and they have to cook something just so or at least fulfill an assignment and then sometimes they have to make just inordinate portions in a very limited amount of time and you get to watch all the stress and all the success. I wonder what Gordon Ramsay would say about the flavor and the presentation of the meal prepared before us this evening. I wonder what he would have said that first Monday Thursday when Jesus broke bread and he distributed it, saying, this is my body, this is my blood. Or Marco, who apparently is a chef. I didn't know this till I did a little bit of digging. Don't worry, I didn't dig too much for this sermon. But apparently there's, there's this Marco who made Gordon Ramsay cry. And I didn't know that was a thing. So they brought Marco. And what would he say about this supper? Well, of course, that's not how you evaluate the Lord's Supper in the slightest. And I, I would think even these TV judges would know that's not how you treat the Lord's Supper. But it's an interesting thought, isn't it? In the upper room, the whole world stops. And there's Jesus with his apostles to celebrate the Passover. Our series has been God on Trial. But you really don't get a lot of that here. No one's here to accuse or contem condemn Jesus. You might say, well, Judas is there. He's about to betray him. He's already given over the money. But he's not here to critique the flavor and the presentation of Jesus' body and blood. And he's not even there to volunteer what he's doing behind the scenes. And he's not fooling anyone. The goal wasn't to make the tastiest, choicest festival sort of a meal for the New Testament church initiated this evening when Jesus gave over this bread and this wine and said, this is my body, this is my blood. But you and I hardly have to think without being able to recite those words to each other. I think for the catechism class, it's one of the easier ones to memorize and spit back at me, and, and they know. We say this week after week after week, this is my body, this is my blood. And yet, Jesus didn't give these words to us to get so used to them we don't even think about them. Or on the flip side, he didn't give us these words, this meal for us to scrutinize and judge it, did he? On the other hand, Jesus didn't tell us that by defending what he had to say that we're doing some great big deal. His words are powerful enough to give the kind of, the kind of thing that the meal needs to, for, to really forgive sins and to really be his body and his blood. So tonight is an evening to just sit back and think about those words and to trust that Jesus gave these words to us for peace, for comfort in this world of sin, for forgiveness, for what we might call respite. Just a rest, just a break. Let the whole world stop. And we come in here, and we hear what God has to say. We listen to his words. The bread and the wine is consecrated, and we receive the Lord's true body and his true blood, in true communion with the bread and wine that hasn't been annihilated or, or gone away, 
with this impact of real forgiveness, real gifts and benefits that Jesus means to give us. It's a good thing to think about because God's word and communion gives us respite. The scriptures teach that we receive Jesus Christ's true body and true blood in, with, and under the bread and the wine. When Jesus says is, there's no reason to make it mean something else. Not is, whether we say represents or symbolizes or signifies. There's, there's no room for that. There's a whole lot of room for us to subordinate what we think and how we reason it out to what God's word literally says. We're supposed to do this, meaning take bread and wine and consecrate and still give it to believing sinners at the end of a, of a hard week or maybe ha hard half week. The early Christian church did this every day if you can trust Theodoret, one of the ancient church fathers, or may maybe most days of the week in certain contexts. This was something that was desired, something that they were told to do often, and you and I too, not just to do this, but to do this often. Well, how often? Jesus doesn't say how often, but we do know that it's for us. It's not for Jesus. Um, it's not for some kind of victory march. Again, it's not for the taste or the presentation. It's for you, for many. What does that mean? Well, it goes on and it talks about how it's for the forgiveness of sins in Matthew and Mark. It really is God's forgiveness that's impressed upon the heart of the believing sinner who needs that in time, from time to time, knowing the guilt of our sins. Repentance isn't a one-time deal. It's a lifelong thing. And so God distributes forgiveness to us in full as we go along this life. It's something we desire as we wrestle with our consciences and as we wrestle with temptation to sin once again after we leave this place. Or you could also think about how Luke and Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, who also gives us the words of institution, it seems Jesus Christ himself taught this to Paul so he could share it with the Corinthians and other, other Christians. It's worded, this cup is the new covenant in my blood or the New Testament. Now, in the New Testament, we're not talking about something that's a new work or a new rule. In the New Testament, what God gives is received by faith and by faith alone. And in that way, it transcends the Old Covenant because this was a fact already in the time of Abraham. So the idea isn't to go through the motions mindlessly or to treat it as any other meal. The idea is to trust and to love Jesus' words that give us respite. Now you do get some variation among the three evangelists who record Jesus' words and Paul. There's very easy explanations for those, but one thing that's always the case, whether you're looking in those first three Gospels of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or St. Paul in 1 Corinthians, no matter who you're looking at, Jesus always says, this is my body, emphasizing the word is. And our Lutheran formula of Concord, back to 1580, says this, unanimously and with the same words and syllables, he says, this is my body. Distinct, clear, firm, and true words of Christ, all together in one way without any interpretation, trope, figure, or change. There's no messing this up when you understand that Jesus' words are Jesus' words. When adding all these things up, the word of Christ tells us that this supper is a medicine for the desperate and, yes, a heavenly dish for the spiritually hungry. Um, not too long ago, we had our taste of Bethlehem where we invited preschool families. And then if you come to that, you know that there's different dishes from your background. So we get a Korean dish or an Indian dish or um, just a American dish or a German dish. There's all these different dishes. Now just imagine if someone came in and you said, Where, where's your dish from? And he said, from heaven. I brought mine from heaven. Well, I would imagine that's, that's the most stunning dish that we'll, we'll get tonight. But it's just bread and wine. That's what it looks like. 
At the same time, it would be the most stunning dish because none of those other dishes, by virtue of Jesus Christ's words, has been able to say, this forgives your sins. Tonight, communicants are welcome to the taste of Bethlehem with the dish that is for us from heaven. Something to think about every time that we approach the Lord's Supper. Because we're here for the Word of God. And it's the Word of God, not any recipe from some foreign land or some ancestry that makes it what it is. True forgiveness. We should be aware, though, as much as we, as much as we rest and, and find respite in these words of the supper, we should be aware of how people do put not God on trial so much. Many Christians, though, put God's word on trial when it comes to how he instituted this supper. There's a little bit of homework. Another thing that I did was look at some popular preachers online just to see what they had to say about the Lord's Supper. Some samplings of popular preachers. I won't tell you who they were. One of them said, the Lord's Supper means Christ embodies our worship and praise. I don't really know what that means, but he didn't go on to explain it, really. Another person said it activates our faith. I suppose that could be true. I'm not really sure what, what's intended with the word activate. Most of them wanted to emphasize how it's a memorial. A memorial for Jesus Christ dying. And that's true. But then, if you listen closely, you hear they're saying it's really just a memorial. And um, you also hear that we really should respect this more. We, sh we should respect the is in the this is my body and my blood. No matter what denomination or what affiliation the church was, it seemed like there's sort of a trend in Christianity that it should be respected, that it should be taken seriously is another way they have, they've said that. Now, good things to think about, perhaps, um, one might dress up the only a memorial meal as dignified as you like, and yet there is some trouble. The trouble with that remains, it's odd and ironic that when people take it only as a memorial meal, they forget the is, the for you, and the for forgiveness of sins. Because this too were the words of Jesus and the intention of taking the body and the blood which when he signified the bread and the wine is, the body and the blood. So um, I think there is something to the fact that, that Jesus said, in remembrance of me, this was his last will and testament. Jesus intended to say that, and we take it as he said it, as his last will and testament as a man who was going to his death. But what do we remember then? Yes, we remember the cross, do the body and the blood, does eating that really signify the death? That would be interesting because Jesus wasn't chewed to death. He wasn't baked to death. He wasn't broken to death. None of his bones were broken, in fact. Better to just subject our reason to the word of God and listen. Listen to everything he has to say and gather it into the way that we celebrate this festival that it's, it's given in remembrance of him. That's how we eat and drink it. But it also is the true body and the true blood for you for the forgiveness of sins. That's what Martin Luther said in his third part in Holy Communion that is the main thing in this, for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Something to believe. This is what our Augsburg Confession says. For to remember Christ is to remember his benefits and to realize that they are truly offered to us. So his Last Supper is here to cheer and to comfort the anxious conscience. On the other hand, there are those who wish to make it into a sacrifice instead of a sacrament, something that is done for God rather than something that God does for people. And the church body that seem to put, seems to put this out most uh, really has, doesn't have anything to do with, with faith. Faith alone in the word of Christ doesn't make a material difference when receiving this sacrifice, which is actually done for God, not so much 
received. But you and I have heard it already. This is the New Testament in Jesus' blood. And in the New Testament, faith and faith alone is key in receiving God's blessings. Let all the world stop. Let all of those human interpretations quit as you approach the table and and as Jesus offers you this supper. Jesus can do what he intends to do. And if Jesus makes is mean is, you and I have nothing to say about it. However, there is a judge as we approach the Lord's Supper. And it's important for us to remember, maybe, maybe, and this is the practical advice, maybe it's not something we always remember to do. It is important for you to remember that you are a judge when it comes to this meal. You're not a judge of the meal. You're not a judge of the food or the word of God involved in the meal. But you are a judge of yourself. God has given you the opportunity as you approach this to self-examine, to consider yourself in light of God's word and where you stand before him. Apart from grace, where would you be before God? And what Christians come up with is the fact that I am a sinner and I need God. I need what he has to say and therefore I want what he has to give. And what he gives is forgiveness his true body, and his true blood. And believing that, you know that as judge of your own actions, now you won't have to face an angry almighty judge in doubt, but believing you may face a judge who treats you in love and care according to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. After all, Jesus himself judged his own feelings as he approached this supper. He said, I have eagerly desired, literally desired a desire, to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Eager desire. This self-examination, this cross-examination Jesus had, it put him to the end of his life. He was thinking about his death. He was thinking about his death for you and for me and what the price of forgiveness cost him so that it wouldn't cost us anything at all. Once you take Jesus' words as intended in your own cross-examination, only then can the world stop. Only then can we find respite in the sacrament. Comfort your alarmed conscience. Be confident that what's promised in the New Testament is the remission of sins, full and free. Know that Christ's word is sure and this is, I'm reading from the confessions again, as sure as though and still surer if Sure, than if God, by a new miracle, would declare forgiveness from heaven. Just imagine that. Imagine if God introduced a new meal from heaven. A pastor comes to you and says, hey, I've got this new meal from heaven. God gave it. He said it's, it's really the best meal you'll ever taste. And you look at it, and it has the finest things you could ever want. It has your favorite meat, your favorite bread, your favorite fruit and vegetable, your favorite dessert, or the absence of those things if you don't like them. Whatever it is, it's what you desire. You would be able to look at that new meal that the preacher gave you from heaven and say, no, that's not for me. There's only one meal from heaven that's for me, and it's from the lips of Jesus. It's just simple bread, and it's just simple wine but it consoles me when I'm godly, and it consoles me when I'm stricken to my conscience. It's there for me when I need it, because it's in the means of grace where God offers it, and it's free. And God loves me enough to feed even me. Find respite for your souls this evening, communicants, and look forward to it if you are not yet a communicant. We're all excited for you to get here with us. But for now, trust God's forgiveness and know that this is just a foretaste of what we will all be eating up in heaven with our Savior Jesus. It's in his name we say amen.